If you have your Bible with you, we're going to read from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And this is just part, just part of the Sermon on the Mount. A tremendous sermon, a very, very long sermon that was preached by our Lord and Saviour. We're going to read from verse 37. Verse 37. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of our, your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same, and if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans also. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. May God bless the reading of his word today to our hearts. I don't know about you, but I know that certainly in years gone by, we had to memorize quite a number of the Beatitudes in the Sermon of the Mount here. I don't know whether you're familiar with all the Sermon on the Mount, this long, long sermon that was preached by our Lord and Saviour. It was a sermon that cut across many, many people. It was a sermon that the Lord declared from uh, his heart. It was a very touching sermon. And it reminds us about every attitude that we have and also our responsibility in life. I'm going to lift out just one of those Beatitudes today. And I want to speak on the verse, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. And so we'll class this as the second mile Christian. The other phrase that I want us to highlight today is what Jesus said towards the end of chapter 5, And if ye you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? And that little phrase I've underlined in my Bible, What do ye more than others? Sometimes I think we can get a very full picture of ourselves Maybe sometimes we lay too much importance on ourselves. And yet we realize that Jesus said, what really do we do more than others? And whenever we have done everything that we possibly can do, we have to confess that we are but unprofitable servants. Now I realize that as I start to preach this sermon today, that I'm preaching to many, and no doubt I would class you the second and the third male Christian. Those who are not content just to go one mile, but those that do many, many things behind the scenes. I thought it was a very interesting thing. I don't think it is the norm for a child. But we have some lovely little children who come along here to the church, to Sunday school, and to Life Leonard's. And two Friday nights ago, whenever I asked a question, and I said, I happen to have a pound in my pocket here, and I'll give it 
to whoever answers it. And so there's a wee girl answered the question. And I know this is not the way maybe that parents will bring up their children. Now, I would always say, make sure that you teach your children to tithe. And as Mrs. Booth says, if you teach them to tithe, you'll teach them to be honest. But this wee girl, whenever she got her pound, it was not the norm. She goes and she puts it into the missionary bottle. Now, that is not the norm for any child. It wouldn't have been the norm, I'm sure, for mine either or for anyone. But there's someone who I think was very, very touching. Tells me a lot, of course, about how the Lord uses even little children. Now, the story here before us, or this passage here, is about doing more than what we're required of us. I was thinking the other day, I don't know what really brought this thought into my heart, but I thought that whenever a church is maybe looking for a new pastor, maybe it was because I said last weekend that I, Jonathan and Jenny were entertaining the man that is coming to, I don't know whether the church will call him or not, but I, um, they offered him a bed and they offered him uh, obviously everything. And I believe that God always blesses us whenever we open up our homes to his children. But I said last week in Jonathan's church in England, they do things a little bit different because whenever they're looking for a new pastor, uh, um, they advertise the job. And so Jonathan said to me, because he's an elder in that church now, he said, uh, you know, Dad, there's all these people responded, but amazingly, the majority of them don't even believe in creation. And so I... Um, they had the preacher for last week. I don't know how they'll get on. And unless, of course, I, I hear from them, I'll not ask. But I was thinking to myself, I wonder what the qualifications are that they're looking for in their new pastor. The Reverend Cross, who was a pastor in Belfast in years gone by, he used to say whoever went to Belfast as a pastor would need to be able to advise what kind of washing machine to buy because people involved you in all things. And that's interesting. But I realize, of course, that in the Lord's work, there's an awful lot more to the ministry than standing in a pulpit and bringing over the Word of God. You know, there's a lot of it been there uh, in the midst of the dilemmas and the crises that all of us as families at some time in our lives will pass through. Now, I'm back to this thought here. What do ye more than others? Do not even the publican so. And I want to keep it in mind, and I've said this before, I've never used the pulpit as a firing range, and I don't intend to. I don't intend to. And I like to speak as to how I find people. I like to do that. But I say this here, dear friends, that there is a responsibility on us whenever we are saved of going the second mile. Now, sometimes I think it's possible for us to think that we are going all the miles. And maybe in reality, if everything's analysed, maybe we're not spending that much time in the work of God, perhaps. Perhaps we're spending more time on many other things other than the work of God. Now, the background to this passage here, we must remember that Palestine in the days of Jesus was an occupied country. Roman forced its rule over the people of Israel by maintaining garrisons of Roman soldiers stationed throughout the country. And according to the Roman law, a Roman soldier could require a Jewish citizen to carry his pack for him for a distance of one mile. He could request that. Now, of course, we know that whenever it comes to worship, our Lord and Saviour gives to us some instructions about worship and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I remember someone uh, that was a policeman. I, I had a chat with one time, and I said to them, I said, how is it that you seem to be able to get out to church, even in the midst of troubles and all? How is it that you seem to be able to get out? And he gave me an answer. I never forgot it. He says, I can tell you that under our law, we have the right 
to attend a place of worship at least once a day. Or once on, on, the, on a Sunday, rather. He said, don't let anybody tell you that they must work every Sunday. That they can't get out to church because, he says, that is choice. We have a right to worship. Now, we must remember our rights, of course, whenever it comes to our own Christianity. And so under the Roman law, the Roman soldier could require the Jewish citizen to carry his, ba- his pack or his burden for the distance of one mile. Now, there's a good example in the life of Simon the Serene in Matthew 27 and 32, the man who was made carry the cross of Jesus. Now, there are two ways to obey being commanded by a soldier to carry the pack. And it's the same in the work of God. There's two ways that you and I can do anything, and that is we can do it grudgingly, accepting it, and I always say, don't do it. Don't do it. If you have to be pushed all the time to do something or you do it with a grudge, forget about it because you can't expect much blessing in your life. Unless you do it heartily as unto the Lord, well, then you're better not doing it. The second way to do it is to do it graciously and cheerfully. And so the first mile uh, really speaks of obligations. The second mile is seen as an opportunity. Now, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and I want us today just to filter our lives through some of this because it's a very important sermon. Jesus said to love one's neighbor is the first mile. Well, it's very easy to love those that love us. It's very easy to cheer on those that love us and those that will encourage us and those that will always pat us in the back and say, oh, you're doing a great job, we couldn't do without you and all the rest of it. That is the first mile. To love one's neighbour is the first mile. To love one's enemies is the second mile. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Why? Because Jesus said as a result, you'll heap coals of fire upon his head. Now the other things that Jesus points out in this sermon is to bless those that bless you. Is the first mile. You know, whenever someone comes and they tell you, oh, you're doing a good job and you're wonderful and all the rest of it, that's the first mile. But to bless those that curse you and those who say all sorts of things about you, that's going the second mile. We could go on, as Jesus talked about, to do good to those who do good to you. Someone comes and they do good to you and they help you out and they cheer you along and all the rest of it. Oh yes, you like to do good and you're going to pat them in the back and you appreciate all that they've done. That's only the first mile. The second mile is to do good to those who hate you. That is second mile Christianity. And so I today in this sermon, Christ is emphasizing Second mile Christianity. And so, as I mentioned about the Roman mile, I understand the Roman mile is a thousand paces or uh, approximately, and I'm, I'm not into metric today, I uh, but approximately 1,520 yards, a little bit shorter than the English mile. I understand there's about 50,000 miles uh, um, of Roman roads through the empire. And at each mile point, there was a stone marker. And these markers, I pointed directions and determined the distance to the next town and so on. And so hence, we get that little expression sometimes, all roads lead to Rome. Do you hear that expression? That's probably where it's coming from. The second mile principle, someone has said, it will put a smile on your face. It will put a spring in your step. It will put a song in your heart. 
Now, whenever we were going to the funeral service yesterday outside Kells, and obviously a church that you would say is in the back of beyonds, but it's going a lot, an awful lot of years. I, um, like most times, we get lost a bit. So we did a bit of a loop of Kells. Now, Kells isn't a very big place, but sure, I never been in Kells. But I, we passed by a house, and my wife says to me, she says, is that where the man lived that you talked about in years gone by? Who you used to visit, who was so sacrificing as far as the work of God went? I said, no, you're in the wrong district. <laughs> We're in Kells. That house is near uh, Temple Patrick. And I said to her, that house isn't there now. I drove down that road one day, and uh, there's a new bungalow there now. But you see, there used to be a little man lived in this house at the side of the road. And he was so small. And I've told you before about him that I, I used to go to a prayer meeting and I, I lived in West Cork. And he prayed for us. And one day I'm visiting him and he answers the door and he says to me, Malcolm, I have something to tell you. And I wondered what it was. He says, you know, from I cross 90, I'm beginning to feel it. And I stood and I laughed and I said, Robert, there was something wrong if you weren't beginning to feel it, you know. But you know, I've said before, I used to go to every man's house. And I was sitting with this pint of milk. Now, I'm a country man too. You don't get too carried away with some of the, all this posh stuff and all. Fair enough if you're into that. But he was sitting with this pint of milk and his plate of spuds and butter. But I can tell you one thing, dear friend. That man invested even in this very church building here. And I used to think to myself, he would give me this money for the church. I used to think, you know, Robert, you have a better getting yourself a good steak or getting yourself something better. And he used to say to me, Malcolm, I want you to remember one thing. In the last days, God will not be looking over you for degrees. He'll be looking over you for scars. There's a lot in it. And so whenever I pass that house, Robert's gone, he's in heaven now. The house is replaced. Whoever came after us, a wee council house at the side of the road. And obviously things has moved on. But there's a man and he was living for God and he was living the second mile. Already said it, dear friends, the second mile will put a smile on your face. And many of these days, our Christians need that. A spring in our steps and a song in our hearts. I read this here as a statement that whenever a person is all wrapped up in themselves, you ever meet somebody and they're all wrapped up in themselves? And they're all wrapped up in their family and they're not worried about anybody else as long as my children do well and get good jobs and all the rest of it. It doesn't really matter much about anybody else. They're wrapped up in themselves. And I read this here, a person wrapped up in themselves makes a very small package. A very small package. The second male Christian today is a character male. Jesus says, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now the Romans had a practice they had learned from the Persians approximately 600 years earlier that if a Roman soldier sees the Jewish boy, he can command him to carry the backpack, remember, one mile. But what did Jesus say? Go two miles. Go two miles. Oh, I imagine that a young Jewish lad could say, but why would I go two miles? I'm only supposed to go one mile. No, Jesus said, whoever compels you to go one mile, make sure that you go two with them. You see, most Jews wouldn't carry the pack one inch farther than the law required. And you know there's some Christians like that. Some believers like that. I remember hearing preachers saying that 
There's many Protestant people and there's make tremendous good Catholics. Able to get out to, to worship once in the week and that's it. You know, dear friends, today, can you imagine how these Jews felt whenever Jesus said, no, he said, it's the second mile. And I've said it, dear friends, over these last number of weeks. It's not popular today to quote the words of the Lord Jesus that if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus, you say goodbye to that big world out there. And you take up your cross and you follow him. Because no man can serve two masters. Oh yes, many will tell us today, oh, you can serve two masters and all the rest of it. You can't. You can't do it. If God's God, follow him. If not, follow Beal. And so Jesus said, go the second mile. I'm sure the young man would have said, look, Jesus, you must be joking. Does he really expect us to go farther than the law required? In essence, Jesus is saying that the disciples uh, need to do more than the legalists who are no more than, uh, do no more than what is required of them. So what do you more than others? I want to ask you, dear friend, today, how much involved are you in the work of God? Because what do we more than others? God has not saved you and me to put us into a china cabinet for people to smile at us and say we look well and all the rest of it. No, there's a big world out there that needs Christ. For C.T. Studd, of course, who said that he is no fool to give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. It is to do more than is required or expected of us. Jesus is saying that any pagan or any unsaved person, they can go the first mile. But my disciples ought to be going the second mile. The first mile, is, remember, is to love those who love us. The second mile is to love those who don't love us. Let me ask you today, are there those that you don't love? I preached a, ser- a sermon here, mind you, that I believe was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit a number of weeks ago about a better spirit. And I always believe in preaching the whole counsel of God and leaving it because the consequences is up to the individual then. You have a better spirit today against someone, you need to deal with it because it'll ruin you. It will eat your life like a cancer. And so the second mile is to love those who don't love us. Are there those today that don't love us? Oh, I'm sure in the work of God, we will find that there will be those who will not always clap us in the back. That's not really that awfully important. And you will have Christians today that will walk in and out of your life, perhaps. We've all had them. But I would like to think that no matter who walked in and out of my life or my wife's life, that if they arrived at our manse today, the door's open. What do we more than others? The second mile is a commitment mile. Commitment. I used, and not the same illustration, but something similar in the prayer meeting there a couple of weeks ago, Uh, But I'm sure you've heard this before, that if you look at the Ulster fry, Irish fry, British fry, whatever you want to call it. I remember hearing of someone, remember we were in the south of Ireland, and they were selling British queens at one side of the road coming to Newry there. And they're selling Irish birds at the other, and they're all the same, but the people could have a choice. Well, if you think of the fry today, you remember that the hen makes a contribution to the fry. That's all. She lays an egg, makes a contribution. But the old pig makes a commitment. His life's in the plate. And so Jesus said, whoever compels you. Now this word compel, it carries with it a readiness, a willingness to submit to inconvenience or unreasonable demands. 
And again, dear friends, that is not popular language today in Christian circles. Inconvenience. Doesn't suit me to do it. Doesn't suit me. Let somebody else do it. No, we don't want any inconvenience. Or unreasonable demands. So somebody else can do it. In Luke 6 and 30, give to, to every man that asketh, and from the, uh, and uh, to him that uh, taketh away thy goods, uh, you, we're not to ask for them again. Now Jesus said, when a Roman soldier asks you, but then he goes on and he says, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, dear friend today in the light of Calvary and what Christ has done for you are you stuck as it were and you look at your life and say poor me this is me this is my family this is my life I can't do anything else as long as everything is all right in my side of things is that our attitude today Jesus said here he said if whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile it could be a neighbor. It could be a friend. It could be an enemy. It could be a co-worker. I'm almost through this morning. Second mile Christianity. And I'll say it again, and I preach as much to my own heart uh, this morning, that I, um, maybe we think that we do more than what we really do. But you know, dear friends, there should be nothing comes before the work of God and the service of God. Absolutely nothing. As Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 33, seek first the kingdom. And then all these things shall be added unto us. Christ lived in the second mile. He lived in the second mile whenever it came to his life. Do you remember he was eating with Zacchaeus, a known tax collector, a thief? Jesus was eating with him. He was going the second mile. The man was hated by the people, but he was loved by the Lord Jesus. You think of our Lord's prayer life, the second mile... He was praying until there was great drops of blood coming from his brow. He's fighting for 40 days and 40 nights with Satan. The first mile is often the ignored mile. Maybe we seldom hear it preached about. But this word compel, remember, it carries the idea of readiness, willingness to submit to inconvenience and unreasonable demands someone has said this and I think it's so true there's no traffic jams in the second mile no traffic jams the second mile can be a lonely mile it can be a lonely road perhaps just the Lord and you there are two types of Christians on this roadway think of those who travel the second mile willingly and those who are forced to travel it. The second mile is not a crowded road. Yes, it can be lonely. Satan can attack you in the second mile road. There's no marker to say that you've reached it. No, you go on and on and on. There can be these attacks in the second mile. Those who will seek to lure you off the second mile. I tell you, dear friend, today... On the authority of the word of God. You make sure that your children today. I have no reason to believe that you, that you wouldn't. Make sure above everything else. That you seek to get them to honour God. May not always walk in God's ways. But leave the foundation there. To put God first. In everything. Satan can use friends, he can use family, he can use fear on the second mile. But it's the second mile that leads to joy. 
Over in the New Testament, Paul uses the description, the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. The word means hilarious. Just as we often say, and of course we've said it down through the years here, God has always been so good to us as a fellowship, but never ever give God 10p if it's not been given willingly. No, you hold on to it. Don't ever start tithing if you're not doing it willingly. Hold on to it. Wrap yourself up in it. But you'll be the poorer as a result. Well, there can be a tax in the second mile. But the second mile leads to rewards. Why should we go on it? Because Christ has left us an example. What do you more than others? Friends, today we can look at our unsaved. Those maybe in our families, those in our communities, and maybe we have to ask ourselves, but what do we do more than them? The hymn writer goes like this here, Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. I could go on today, I'm not going to. The second mile in prayer. I have a cousin that emails me from Canada. And I, um, he has a good job and family and all over there. But you know, he said to me the other day again, he says, you know, Malcolm, Monday is my fast day. I spend a Monday fasting and praying. For you, your family, for my own family. That's the second mile. Oh, the second mile never comes to witnessing. The second mile never comes to giving. What do we more than others? Dear friends today, let us always seek to invest our lives in the kingdom of God. We're going to sing our Concluding, um, which is all my tomorrows, all of my past, Jesus is Lord of all. And we'll stand again, maybe to sing.
And I pray, Father, that those words will be very, very true from all of our hearts, that Jesus is Lord of all. Father, bury your word deep in our hearts, give to us willingness to serve you and to let you ever have your own unhindered way in all of our lives. Thank you for your presence. Pray for your blessing and your peace to go with us as we go now on our onward journey. In your name we pray. Amen.